we're looking at the brink of a quantum materials revolution. It's about what science can do and what society can become. Falling walls. What a great image. Overall, I think it's a huge message of hope. It's a unique event of that kind. That's really exciting. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Is, is, is this, this is real? I really enjoy putting my ideas into what's possible in terms of innovation. Hello everybody, my name is Professor Julie Owens and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research at Deakin University. I'm delighted today to welcome you all to Falling Walls Lab Victoria in 2021, a state level heat of this international pitch competition, one that provides a global platform for our early and mid-career creators, innovators, trailblazers and visionaries. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all gathered. For me, this is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Now, Deakin University has been involved in the Vesky Falling Walls program previously, hosting a heat in 2019. We continue to strongly support the program as a powerful mechanism to highlight and promote uh, our most talented emerging researchers and innovators as they seek to create positive impact for our communities. Now in 2021, we were approached by Vesky to support the delivery this year, and we're delighted to continue our involvement. We had hoped to deliver the event to you in person at our Deakin downtown campus. We were nevertheless very excited to bring you the next best thing. Now, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Melbourne Laureate and Professor Emeritus Andrew Holmes, an inaugural Vesky Innovation Fellow, former Vesky Board Director, immediate past president of the Australian Academy, and Chair of the Falling Walls Lab Victoria in 2021. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Julie, and hello, everybody. As a representative of Vesky, I'd like to inform you of what an impact it's made on attracting intellectual capital to the state of Victoria. And it's done that by drawing 27 Vesky Innovation Fellows back to Victoria or to Victoria for the first time. And that has really made uh, Victoria a very strong intellectual base in STEM subjects. And Vesky has survived through parties of both political persuasion. And I think that's an indication of just what an effective organization it is. I had the privilege of being the first uh, Vesky Fellow in 2004, and it has continued to evolve interactions with education, uh, and most recently inspiring women's program uh, in science, including fellowships, professional development, and in 2021, career recovery grants to seek support for women in STEM to enable them to achieve their leadership goals and stimulate long-term cultural change from within their organizations. Now, 60 years ago, the Berlin Wall was put up to stop people moving from effectively 
the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, through into West Berlin, and then possibly on into the rest of the world, and particularly West Germany. And in, on the 9th of November, 2009, that wall fell, as you saw brilliantly demonstrated in the video we've just watched. The Falling Walls Conference was established to celebrate the fall of that Berlin Wall through innovations and breakthroughs in science, technology, and the humanities. And that meeting has been going uh, for well over uh, many years, in fact. I had the privilege of being invited by the president of Falling Walls to attend in 2015. And in fact, I've been attending the meeting ever since then until COVID prevented us from traveling. And I would think this is one of the best three or four meetings for young researchers in the world. It sits within now within Berlin Science Week. Berlin's a very exciting city, young people and a huge investment in science. And that Science Week runs from the 1st to the 10th of November. And as you saw, there are several components. There's the Falling Walls Lab, which you're involved in, but as well, there's Falling Walls Ventures, Falling Walls uh, uh, Exchange, Falling Walls uh, Circle, and uh, Falling Walls uh, Breakthroughs, which are the main event on the 9th of November, when speakers talk about their, what breakthroughs in science and humanities are going to change the world. Now, the final Falling Walls Lab will be held in Berlin on the 7th of November. And we in Australia are fortunate through the engagement and vigorous participation of people like you to be able to send three finalists. Unfortunately, that will be virtual, but take that chance to get to Berlin when you can in the future. The Australian Academy of Science has been hosting that ever since that first meeting when I was able to go to the Falling Walls Brain Box and say, how can Australia get involved? And I'm delighted to see that it's expanded now until uh, it's reached nearly all the states in Australia. And I have the privilege of serving as chair of today's Falling Walls Lab in Victoria. And it's time to say a warm, grateful thanks to all the supporting organizations, the Falling Walls Foundation, the Australian Academy of Science, the Federal Republic of Germany's Embassy in Canberra, and Euraccess, Australia and New Zealand, all who have contributed to making this possible today. And of course, we should also thank our friends and partners in Vesky who put a lot of effort into making this what's going to be a very smooth and exciting event. Well, now I'd like to turn to uh, introduce Dr. Jen Martin, who's a senior lecturer in communication, science communication at the University of Melbourne. And she founded and leads and teaches the University of Melbourne's acclaimed science communication teaching program. And you may have also encountered her in her very popular segments on 3RRR. Welcome to you, Jen. Hello. And thank you so much to both Professor Julie Owen and to yourself, Professor Emeritus Andrew Holmes AC for the wonderful welcome and introduction. And I would certainly like to say happy National Science Week to everyone. Uh, being the science nerd that I am, this is clearly my favorite week of the year. As you heard, I'm Jen. I founded and lead the University of Melbourne Science Communication Teaching Program. I'm Dr. Jen on 3 R, and I was fortunate to be selected for last year's Vesky STEM Side-by-Side -side Program. And of course, I'm delighted to be your MC today. And as someone who was fortunate enough to be a high school exchange student and to travel to Berlin only a couple of years after the Berlin Wall fell, I feel very privileged to be part of this event. And as you've just heard from Andrew, it is indeed an exciting and a prestigious event that we are so lucky to be hosting here in Victoria. And I have to tell you that Vesky received many applications for this year's Victorian competition. So the people that you are meeting today have come through following pre-selection, a very vigorous pre-selection process. 
And we have 10 finalists already to pitch their research and their innovations to you today. So let me begin by explaining how today is going to work. First up, what we're looking for today are three finalists from today's event who will then go through to compete at the national finale, Falling Walls Lab Australia, which will be hosted by the Australian Academy of Science on the 1st of September this year. How are we gonna select those three finalists? Well, each presenter today gets two and a half minutes only to pitch their ideas, followed by a very strict two minutes of questions and answers with our esteemed jury members, who I'm gonna introduce you to shortly. One of my jobs today is to time the Q&A session to ensure that each participant is provided with the same amount of time and therefore the same opportunity to convince the jury of their innovative ideas that are gonna impact science and society. So I need to apologize in advance that I'm gonna be speaking over people and cutting off our speakers when they run out of time. Following the 10 finalist presentations, we'll be giving you, our audience, the opportunity to vote for your favorite presenter via the Falling Walls Lab Victoria People's Choice Award. We're gonna be using a Menti QR code, so please have your phone handy. And the winner of the People's Choice Award will be announced at the end of this week, National Science Week. Now, before we get underway with our presentations, I do wanna introduce you to our esteemed jury who have the very challenging task of selecting finalists to go through to the Australian finale. And I have to say, having uh, heard about the work that we're gonna uh, listen to presentations about today, rather them than me having to make these decisions, now, please be aware that together our jury truly have enough, enough accolades, not just to sink a ship, but to sink a whole fleet of ships. And if I were to attempt to fill you in on all of their roles and honours and experiences, we'd be here all day. So please accept these brief introductions. Now, of course, I'm gonna begin with Melbourne Laureate Professor Emeritus, Professor Andrew Holmes, AC, FAA, FRS from the University of Melbourne, who is the chair of Falling Walls Lab Victoria and who you've just met. Andrew is the immediate past president of the Australian Academy of Science, the inaugural Vesky Innovation Fellow, as you've just heard, and the former Vesky Board Director. Andrew is a synthetic and polymer chemist who's won a multitude of awards, and we're really thrilled that he's our jury chair today. Next, we have Dr. Selena Lowe, who is Executive Director of the Australian Global Health Alliance. Selena is a medical doctor who also has postgraduate degrees in international and public law. Among other places, she's worked for Doctors Without Borders, leading medical humanitarian project teams all over the world. And for the past seven years, she's been a senior editor at The Lancet. Thank you and welcome, Selena. Our next jury, jury member is Dr. Fabio Spardi, Minister, Councillor and Deputy Head for the European Union's delegation to Australia. Fabio holds postgraduate qualifications in international law and political science and previously worked at the European External Action Service HQ as the desk for the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in Japan, Korea, Australia and New Zealand. Thank you, Fabio. Mr. Andrew Weir is the Director of Economic Development and International at the City of Melbourne. Andrew is a policy expert, author and speaker with degrees in politics, law, economics and public policy. He has a new book coming out in September this year called Recovery, How We Can Create a Better, Brighter Future After a Crisis, which clearly we are all gonna to need to read because it's very topical. Welcome, Andrew. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Janice Munt, who joined the Vesky Board of Directors in 2020. Janice holds degrees in economics and politics and served for eight years as an elected member of, member of the Victorian Parliament. Her roles included Parliamentary Secretary for Health and Senior Advisor to the Minister for Women and Prevention of Family Violence. Janice is a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and holds a number of company and board roles, 
including Chair of the Central Bayside Community Health Services Board. Welcome to you, Janice. The sixth member of our incredible jury today is Ms. Rohini Kapadath, who is a member of the executive leadership team as Museums Victoria, as the general manager of the Immigration Museum. Rohini has held senior positions at a variety of organizations, including KPMG, SAS Institute, and is the former chair of the Multicultural Ministerial Advisory Council. She's also a member of the Cultural Diversity Advisory Council of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Thank you, Rohini. And last, but definitely not least, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniel Burns, who is a principal with Phillips Ormond Fitzpatrick and a Vesky Inspiring Women STEM side-by-side -side participant in 2018. Danielle has extensive experience as a scientist, and as a patent attorney with expertise in patent strategy, protection and enforcement in the biotech sector. She's also a proud mum of two. So Danielle, let's see whether it's your kids or mine who make the first appearance during today's session. Thank you and welcome to Danielle. Okay, now you know the incredible calibre of our jury today that our speakers need to impress. Good luck to all of them. It's my great pleasure to introduce our very first speaker. I would like to welcome Madok Shabani from Monash University, who is breaking the wall of battery metal storage. Take it away, Madok. We are rapidly electrifying our world, and batteries are the means for that. They also promise to be a critical step in fighting climate change. Climate change is not just a threat, it's an emergency that we are deep, deep into it. And batteries to store the energy of renewables are a key solution. Now everyone knows about the wonderful lithium-ion batteries. They are the workhorse of today's battery technologies. What do you know about its silent partner, Cobalt? Right now, they go together like Bonnie and Clyde. But do we have enough Cobalt to continue making more and more batteries to serve these purposes? The short answer is no. Like any other heavy metals, there is a finite supply. Further, the environmental and humanitarian concerns around cobalt mining is no news to anyone. Now, what if we had a non-metal battery material with less CO2 footprint and a lower risk of supply disruption? Yes, that means I'm here to pitch a new battery chemistry. One such material is iodine. Iodine is not going to be a substitute for cobalt, but more like a supportive technology to lessen the burden of cobalt and its other heavy metal cousins, nickel and iron. I make iodine batteries. The energy performance of iodine battery is as good as an average performing lithium ion battery. It means that it's unlikely that iodine will attract the attention of EV makers. They seem to suffer from severe range anxiety and the high performing cobalt is the made for that. However, some large scale, some impactful applications such as the high volume and cost sensitive market of residential and industrial solar panels could do without the advanced batteries made with cobalt and other heavy metals. And iodine battery could be impactful by serving these sort of applications. Iodine battery could support our efforts toward net zero carbon emission and it could help save on our, our electricity bills. It could also potentially come to the rescue of those regions in the world that frequent power outage is not a story of the past to them, but an everyday reality. Based on these arguments and the battery prototypes that I have made, I'm confident to pitch this new battery chemistry to the R&D sector. Thank you, Madok. Brilliant. Thank you for being our first speaker. I'd like to invite you, please, to join me on screen. And I'd also like to invite, please, Professor Andrew Holmes to join us and to ask his question. Over to you, Andrew. Well, thank you very much, Madok. What exactly do you mean by an iodine battery? And particularly, what is the role of the iodine? Uh, thanks for your question, Professor. So uh, in a typical lithium-ion battery, the 
positive electrode, the cathode, is made of uh, heavy metals, mainly cobalt. So in an iodine battery, that uh, particular component, the cathode will be made entirely out of uh, iodine, which, as I mentioned in my presentation, is a uh, basically cheaper material, a cheaper substitute for cobalt with uh, less CO2 footprint and uh, less risk of uh, supply chain disruption. Thank you, my doctor, and thank you, Andrew, for your question. Now I'd like to invite Janice Munt to pose a question to my doctor. Uh, thank you, Mardok. My question is, um, how far away is your research from commercial viability? Uh, thanks for the question. It's a great question. So uh, this particular battery chemistry, it has not been explored extensively, uh, simply because uh, it is not going to outperform lithium ion battery. But because of the uh, relatively low capacity that this battery has, it also has very few problems to address. And uh, I do have several years of experience with this. And from the prototypes that I have made with the like uh, cycle life that I received this uh, storage capability and the materials availability, I would say one or two years would be the time frame that, uh, that this battery could be validated and basically be introduced uh, to the R&D sector. Beautiful, succinct responses there, my doctor. Very impressive. I didn't even have to speak over you. So thank you very much, my doctor. Well done. And thank you also to Andrew and Janice for your questions. So now it is time for us to move on to our second speaker. It gives me great pleasure to invite, invite Dr. Lars Esser to join us from CSIRO, who is breaking the wall of the brain to cure brain cancer. Thank you, Lars. Hi, oh wait. Hi, my name is Lars. Uh, my aim is to find a cure for brain cancers by breaking the wall of the brain. So thanks to many medical innovations, most cancers can be treated nowadays using surgery, radiotherapy, and especially chemotherapy drugs. Unfortunately, these treatments do not work for brain cancers. And the average life expectancy is only 10 to 16 months. And only one out of 10 people will be alive for more than five years. These very dismal figures are caused really by the location of the tumor as located in the brain. So the brain has a really good defense system around it. It's a bit like a Berlin Wall with very tight border crossings. The thing about what's different is that it actually has a good cause because it protects the brain from all kinds of dangerous toxins. Unfortunately, it also prevents drugs from passing it. So that's why this is a wall that needs to fall in order to cure brain cancers. But wait, we have to be careful because we cannot let it fall permanently like the Berlin Wall, because in that case, the brain is unprotected. So we have to be very careful. To achieve this, I'm using two different strategies. In the first strategy, I'm using this very na tiny nanocarrier, which acts a little bit like a Trojan horse or like a Trabant car in a way that it can fool the border crossing and letting it pass, and this way the drug can go to the tumor. I've done some experience using this method and it works quite well. But wait, there's even a better method. I'm be using a very novel technology called focus ultrasound in combination with microbubbles. This technology allows me to open up the blood-brain barrier for a limited amount of time, but there's enough time for the nanocarry to pass and cut to the brain tumor where it can deliver the drug. In this case, I'm using a radioactive drug because next to its very powerful way of killing tumor cells, it also allows me to track it. So I can use a medical imaging technology to see if the drug really goes to the tumor. And in this way, you can tune this treatment to the patient. At the moment, I'm trialing these two methods using a brain tumor model that I established. Of course, there's no guarantees, but I really hope that soon I can be moved on to clinical trials and perhaps offer a glimpse of hope to the sufferers of brain cancers. Wonderful. Thank you, Lars, and beautiful use of the Berlin Wall falling analogy in your talk. Please join me on the main screen. And could Dr. Fabio Spardi also please join us to pose your question? Hello, Lars. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. 
and uh, uh, my question is this um, would the, your nano nanocarriers have to be adapted to reach different locations in the brain and do you think they could be used to treat other brain diseases i mean other than tumors thank you thank you very much for your question fabio to start from the beginning that these particles they indeed they have have special surface around them so the kind of was targeted to only the brain tumor cells and it wouldn't go to healthy tumor cells and this way we can take advantage of some receptors that's highly expressed onto these tumor cells that can be recognized by the nanoparticles. Next to cryptoma or other brain cancers, you could also think about using these kind of particles to deliver drugs, for example, for uh, Parkinson's disease or even for Alzheimer's. The main problem at the moment is really about passing this barrier and that's really the first step. And when we're able to do this, then we can really try to look more- Lars, what... I'm, af I'm afraid that's your minute. I have to do my nasty job of interrupting, but thank you so much. And I'd like to hand over to Dr. Danielle Burns to please ask a question to Lars. Thanks for the presentation, Lars. Um, my question is, how does your technology compare to other techniques for overcoming the blood-brain barrier, such as intranasal administration? And what are the advantages of your technology? Thank you very much for your question, Danielle. One of the advantages about the Fox ultrasound technology is this can target on a specific part of the brain. And the way it works together with MRI scanning, where an MRI can select, see where your tumor is, and only that part of your brain you're exposed to focus ultrasound. So that is much less potential side effects. Another advantage about it is that it's also, uh, we have quite some good results to collaborate in Queensland. We have about the four times higher uptake of antibodies. So it seems like we already have some proof of concept for this method that works. But indeed, there's not just one method, there are different ways, and it really depends on end which one would be the easiest one to. Oh, Lars, <laughs> beautiful. Like... I don't know if you were just about to stop, but I was just about to ask you to stop. So well done for getting such an interesting response in a very limited time. So thank you for your great presentation, Lars, and thank you to Fabio and Danielle for your questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker, who is Dr. Anushi Rajapaksa from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And Anushi is breaking the wall of life-saving vaccine and therapeutic access. Thank you, Anushi. The thought of a needle might make you cringe, but not everyone has the privilege to enjoy the life-saving benefits of vaccines and therapies currently available. In fact, 23 million children around the world do not have access to basic vaccines and therapies that could protect them from respiratory illnesses. A major contributor, RSV, the really serious virus, not kidding, the respiratory syncytial virus, is now identified as the leading cause of pneumonia and death in children under the age of five years. In Australia alone, children experienced two to seven episodes, costing the Australian economy 24 million to 50 million Australian dollars. Here comes the wall. Currently, there are no approved therapies or vaccines for RSV. The only protection offered by monoclonal antibodies is not only expensive, it's not available to children who need it the most. So we need potentially a range of options. One approach may be to deliver vaccines and therapies directly to the lung to provide frontline defense system. The lungs offer a non-invasive surface and a large surface area for absorption and importantly, access to the immune system. It's actually a simple approach that can be applied in community settings and in unit, even in neonatal intensive care units. We believe one way to outsmart the viruses is to shut the door at the point of entry, which is your lungs. Our patented solution involves a novel acoustic nebulizer based on electromechanical engineering. We use high frequency sound waves to interact with the biomolecule in a gentle manner so that we can break up the surface tension. This gives us the opportunity to target the deep lung. I have led extensive series of preclinical trials and laboratory work, and in particular in a biologically relevant large animal model to show that we can deliver monoclonal antibodies, which is a complex biomolecule, to the lungs in real time. We are now ready to test our solution in a clinical setting. But we need to act fast and we need to act now. 
as by the time we have finished this talk, five children would have lost their life to pneumonia caused by lower respiratory tract infections. So by inhaling your way to protection, we believe that we could knock off the wall of therapeutic and vaccine access. Thank you. Fascinating, Anushi. Thank you so much. And please join me on our uh, virtual stage. It's now time for me to ask Dr. Selena Lowe to please join us and ask a question. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Anushi. Uh, my question is, have other vaccines targeted at the lungs been successfully administered by nebulizer? And if so, how affordable are they? Thank you, Selena, for the question. Um, I guess there's a really good example of that is the measles vaccine that has been administered to children. Um, and this has been partially successful and probably because of the, the method that's been used to administer, but this is not in current practice at the moment because of the complexities. In large clinical trial, they failed to show the efficacy based on IM or intramuscular administration compared to aerosol in that scenario. So, so the field is yet to be explored. Thank you, Anushi, for your wonderful, concise response. Now it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Andrew Weir to join us to pose a question to you. Anushi, uh, could your system be used to deliver other drugs or therapeutics? Thank you, Andrew, for that excellent question. Um, we've done some studies with obviously uh, monoclonal antibodies and plasmid DNA vaccines. Um, but it's not limited to you know, proteins or peptides or biomolecules of that sort. Um, another interesting particle we've trialed is stem cells. So that's something um, that's probably unique to our nebulizer because of the gentle form of the sound waves that, that we're using in the high frequency range. I think that um, there are possibilities are endless in terms of the novel therapies that we could be delivering to the lab and systemically. Thank you. Well done, Anushi. Fantastic job. And thank you also to Selena and Andrew for your excellent questions. You're off the hook, Anushi. You can take a few deep breaths. And I'm going to welcome our fourth speaker. Hello and welcome to Ms. Shumi Ferdusi, who is from Deakin University and who is breaking the wall of costly energy storage. Thank you. Australian pay some of the highest residential electricity bills in the world more than double than those paid in USA. Few years back in 2017, Victoria's largest power supply at Hagelwood was shut down due to its high emission. As a result, many customers experienced power outage. Even last June 21, many places in Victoria's lost power during a storm and power companies switched off the supply because the entire system was at risk. How to overcome these situations? We need to think new energy storage and supply technologies are required, which are reliable, safe, and inexpensive. That's why today's topic is to breaking the wall of its costly energy storage. We have to think more on naturally available resources. Currently, lithium batteries are widely used for energy storage. Lithium is great. We all use it in our phones, in our household stationary equipments, and even in our cars. But lithium is very limited resources. Day by day, the price is going higher with the threat of shortage. That's why we need to find another alternatives which are widely available, economical and ecological. That is sodium and this is my project. As sodium is widely available, you can find in your table salt, in the beach, everywhere. Sodium is lightweight and it can be used to make long life batteries. And as I said, sodium is cheap and environmentally attractive. If you remember from your high school chemistry that water and sodium don't mix. In fact, it will catch fire. I have found water actually can be used as effective additives to improve the battery performance. Particularly, my research focusing on new chemistry using new pure salt electrolytes which are safe and non-flammable, allowing long and stable batteries based on this cheap and plentiful sodium. Electrolytes are the key components of the battery that carries charge from positive to negative and vice versa. I have found inside battery, electrolyte actually uh, uh, binds up the uh, water in a way like a mother holds the child, making it unreactive, but water also helps to improve smooth and stable uh, electrode surface that battery really works well. 
Currently, these uh, materials are manufacturing with collaboration with a local company, Born Moleculars, and at our Deakins Unique Battery Hub facilities, we actually scale up these battery productions for commercial purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shumi, and please join me ready for your question time. Fabio, I'd like to begin with you, please. What would you like to ask Shumi? Hello, um, Shumi. Uh, yes, hello. Yes, sorry about the video. Um, my question is this, how does your sodium battery compare with the lithium battery efficiency wise? Thank you. Well, uh, if you think about this way, efficiency wise, um, is uh, may not um, uh, like, is more or like 99% like to 100%. It is comparable in many ways. If you think about uh, three things, the first thing is cost and availability. And um, so like current uh, lithium market is um, like $6,000 uh, per ton. And where is uh, sodium uh, price is just below $200 per ton. So which one you take? So, and another thing is <clears throat> if um, the e efficiency, the because scientists are actually uh, focusing more on research, de developing different parameters in inside the battery, that that performance, uh, the capacity and the efficiency, they are quite uh, can uh, comparable with lithium and soon it will be uh, used as alternatives with lithium. Oh, Shami, I was just about to interrupt you and you finished beautifully timed. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to hand over to Andrew Weir for your question. Thanks, Shami. Um, what are the most likely use cases for a sodium battery? And where would we expect to see them replace a lithium battery? Uh, so could you please again ask me, could again repeat the question? What are the most likely use cases for a sodium battery? Where would we where would we expect to see them replace a lithium battery? Uh, mostly the, the stationary equipment, and then uh, like uh, phones, um, uh, the computer, laptop, the household stationary equipments, and soon it will become as the automatic electric vehicles, and etc. Thank you so much, Shami. Really fascinating. And thank you also to Fabio and Andrew for our questions. We are just about to hit the halfway mark. So we are now ready for our fifth speaker, who is Dr. Kaleem Kashif from Monash University. And Kaleem is breaking the walls of premium conducting polymers. Thank you, Kaleem. Hello. I hope we all remember watching a movie called as Titanic. Well, fast forward, in 2019, we generated 52 million tons of electronic waste. This is equivalent to almost 1000 Titanic sized ships. This e-waste can be drastically minimized using inexpensive and eco-friendly ink based printed electronics. Imagine having the ability to print a circuit board or a smart sensor using your inkjet printer and then at the end of its life cycle throwing it to a recycle bin? Well, such conductive inks are normally based on conducting polymers, silver or carbon nanotubes or their composites that ranges from few thousand dollars to eighty thousand dollars per kilogram. Some of these materials are also used at large scale in radar absorbing materials for next generation stealth fighters or a warship or in the healthcare sector such as MRI room to shield 5G or 6G signals. Our technology is a family of inks based on metal organic frameworks. They are electrically conducting and extremely adherent to any surface. Our materials are biocompatible because they are generated from green renewable resources using solvents like water or alcohol and eco-friendly upon recycling. These semi-transparent molecules can be produced at two to three orders of magnitude low cost. Yes, you heard right, $10 from $1,000. This year, we have been selected in the Land Forces Pitch Fest competition and D-Start Ignite program. This has helped us 
to establish contacts in the Australian defense industry for early partnering in the area of variable integrated sensors and radar absorbing materials. We are very excited to tap into this into this multi-billion dollar market. But something that thrills us is the sustainability aspect of our innovation. That's why we call it Green Shield. Thank you. Wow, thank you for sharing your research with us, Kaleem. And please join me, lovely to see you. I'd like to welcome back Andrew Holmes to please ask your question to Kaleem. Thank you very much, Kaleem. Can you tell us a little bit more about the structure of your particular metal organic framework? And is it really solution processable for inkjet printing? That's right. Um, the problem with most of the metal organic framework materials is that they are not solution processable. But our materials are highly solution processable and they can be mixed and processed in solvents like water or alcohol. And that is the intellectual um, um, property that we have got in our patent that we are ready to file. Thank you, Kaleem. And now I'd like to invite Rohini to join us for a question for Kaleem. Well, thank you for this really exciting presentation, Kaleem. Could you paint for us a picture of the competitive landscape for this solution? Who are your nearest competitors? Um, our um, nearest competitors are carbon inks, and, but the problem with carbon is it is not inherently adherent to other surfaces. For example, carbon is used as, um, as a grease in, or, um, in most of the applications, but our materials are extremely adherent and they are low cost and they can be solution processed. As, um, as Andrew um, asked the question, that's, that's the most important aspect of our materials that they, you can use them with any solvent. And that's the best aspect we have got in our materials. Um, we, um, we have gone through a very extensive customer discovery pro um, program in civil and defense industry. And we have devised a business plan and we endeavor to um, sell a market ready electromagnetic radiation paint to industries like telecom, healthcare and defense. And moreover, we also want to um, go into and, and integrate further our materials into variable integrated sensors, printed batches, and electronics. Thank you, Kaleem. And yet again, that was split second timing. I'm very impressed. Thank you for presenting your work to us and for responding to those questions. And thank you to Andrew and Rohini for your excellent questions. So deep breaths, we have reached the halfway mark, which means that we have five of our competitors who are taking deep breaths and feeling fairly relaxed, and five who are getting more nervous as they await for their time on the stage. So just to refresh everyone's memory, so far we have heard from Dr. Madok Shaibani from Monash University about breaking the wall of battery metal storage. Then our second speaker was Dr. Lars Esser from CSIRO, who spoke about breaking the wall of the brain to cure brain cancer. Then we heard from Dr. Anushi Rajapaksa from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute about breaking the wall of life-saving vaccine and therapeutic access. Our fourth speaker was Ms. Shumi Ferdusi from Deakin University, talking about breaking the wall of costly energy storage. And finally, we just heard from Dr. Kaleem Kashif from Monash University on breaking the walls of premium conducting polymers. So buckle in for the next stage of our competition, please. And let me introduce you to our sixth, sixth, I can't even speak, sixth finalist. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Nalaki Podar from the University of Melbourne, who is breaking the wall of water insecurity. Thank you, Nalaki. Imagine it's a very hot day in Melbourne today and you're traveling and all you want is a chilled bottle of water. So you get down at Coles, you gulp down that water, thinking that this comes from a safe source. But what if, if it wasn't? 
what if if it comes from here this is a village in bangladesh where most of the population drinks water from tube wells now these kids have no idea that they might even have different kinds of cancers in 20 years time why because water can be contaminated with substances such as arsenic now if arsenic is present in your water right now you won't be able to see it or even taste it now this poses a very big challenge to detect arsenic in drinking water that causes neurodegenerative disorders skin lesions and that is why almost 200 million people around the globe one in every five deaths in Bangladesh occurs due to arsenic poisoning. So the urgent need is to be able to detect arsenic in drinking water accurately. So we looked into nature for a solution. We found out that there are bacteria that feeds on arsenic and there are proteins in the bacteria, as you can see in yellow, that binds with arsenic. And when it does bind, the structure of this protein changes a little bit. Now we propose to develop a novel biosensor based on this arsenic sensing proteins. These proteins will be fused with fluorophores that are spaced across the structure of the protein. Now these fluorophores are molecules that absorbs and re-emits light so they can glow. Now in the absence of arsenic, these two fluorophores will be far away from each other. But in the presence of arsenic, the structure of this protein will bind and will change. Um, bringing the two fluorophores very close to each other, making one of the fluorophores glow. Now, this is what is different in any of the other methods that we have. This biosensor will detect very low levels of arsenic within minutes by just adding a drop of water. Now, our innovation will create an awareness among vulnerable ones to test water before they drink and will motivate them to get a cleaner source of water. It will also help children to go to schools that they are mostly denied of because of the social stigma related to arsenic poisoning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nalaki. Fascinating. And thank you for joining me on our stage. And now I'd like to ask Selena to please pose a question to you. Thanks very much, Nilaki. In reality, from a public health perspective, if your technology was successful, how do you think a Bangladeshi villager could use a positive result to access the clean drinking water they need? Thanks, Selena, for your question. Um, it's an amazing question. And what we are thinking is to have this um, small uh, biosensor. So we'll be sending it to uh, NGOs and ask them to use that before they even drink water. Now, your question is how are they gonna be inspired to get more cleaner source? The problem in Bangladesh and other developing countries is the awareness, the awareness that there might be something in the water before they are drinking. So once they're aware about it, then we are proposing to work with public health department to be able to uh, uh, give them access to cleaner water. For example, go and get it from the municipality rather than getting it from your tubers, which might take a little bit of time, but it is for your better health. So that is what we are trying to aware Bangladesh for. Thank you. Thank you, Nalaki. And now I'd like to invite our jury member, Janice, to please ask Nalaki a question. Um, thank you very much, Nalaki. My question is, uh, what will the cost of your biosensor be? And would it be prohibitive to the, um, in cost to the very poor areas that you're talking about? Exactly. So that is why we are looking into the nature for the protein. So being able to generate these proteins and attaching them with fluorophore costs very little. So we will be charging probably even less than 10 cents. And uh, when we are uh, delivering it to Bangladesh through NGOs, we will be charging them very less. So we're not going to be charging the people in Bangladesh anything but the NGOs. Um, the main idea for them is to be able to use something that they are, don't feel burdened about. So the cost is going to be the minimalistic as available uh, compared to the other biosensors available in the market. Thank you. Thank you, Nalaki. And what fantastic questions from our jury. I wanted to ask exactly the same thing. So thank you uh, so much to both Selena and Janice. And thank you, of course, to Nalaki for a fantastic presentation. Now it's over to our seventh speaker, who is Dr. Saffron Bryant from RMIT University. 
who is breaking the wall of toxic cryopreservation. Thank you, Saffron. Imagine lying in a hospital bed. A life support machine beeps beside your head and the acrid smell of antiseptic fills your nostrils. If you don't get a new heart in the next week, you'll die. The trouble is, with current technology, the compatible donor will have to die within four hours travel time of that hospital bed, or the heart will be thrown away. In fact, 60% of all donated hearts and lungs are discarded because of this tiny time window. And blood products like platelets can only be stored for seven days. These limitations lead to the blood and organ shortages that we're all aware of. And it all comes down to storage, or a lack thereof. The answer is cryopreservation. Cryopreservation is the process of cooling biological samples down to very low temperatures so they can be stored for a long time. However, right now, cryopreservation is limited to a very small number of cell types and no organs at all, which is why that heart only has four hours to get to you. Unfortunately, you can't just throw a heart into liquid nitrogen, which is minus 196 degrees, and expect it to survive. Imagine jagged shards of ice crystals piercing through the cells. It's universally lethal. This is where cryoprotectants come in. Cryoprotectants suppress ice formation, which allows cells to be stored at very low temperatures. However, for the last 50 years, we've relied largely on the same two toxic cryoprotective agents. They just don't work for many cell types. My research is focused on expanding the number of cryoprotectants by literally thousands by exploring biocompatible options that have never been considered for this application before. This is like thiazine solvents, like ionic liquids, which are salts that are liquid at room temperature, and sugar mixtures. I've already successfully stored several cell types using these new cryoprotectants, and now I'm trying to optimize that by trying different combinations and different concentrations. The stem cell therapy market is worth 14.7 billion US dollars and the assisted reproductive market is set to reach 45 billion dollars in the next four years. New non-toxic cryoprotectants will reduce the cost of these technologies, making them more accessible. Also, new cryoprotectants may allow the storage of new cell types for therapeutic applications, as well as possibly storage of organs which would save more than 900,000 lives per year in the US alone, as well as you, lying in that hospital bed. Amazing, Saffron, thank you. And please come and join me for your question time. And first up from our jury now is Danielle to pose a question to Saffron. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks, Saffron, for the presentation. So previous work has demonstrated the cryoprotectant roles of trialose, sucrose, sorbitol and mannitol, at least for the cryopreservation of cells. How does your work differ from what's gone before? Yeah, sure. So a lot of those cryoprotectants that you've mentioned, um, they work on very specific cells or they require special additives to get them into the cells. So trialose, for example, isn't able to enter cells on its own. So we have to include um, like antibiotics almost that put holes in the cells so the trellos can enter. Um, and that's quite toxic and then means that the cells aren't really suitable then for therapeutic applications. So the idea behind mine is that they're non-toxic, but they also act without any additional additives. So you can just throw them in and they work as they are. Great, Saffron, thank you. And now I'd like to invite Fabio to join us and to pose you a question. Hello, Saffron, uh, and thank you for your very interesting presentation. Uh, my question is this, what's your guess estimate of how long the best non-toxic cryoprotectant could ensure safe storage of organs? Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, so ideally, if you can get something down to minus 196 degrees, Theoretically, you can store it forever. Um, now, it's come to light that maybe those estimates have been optimistic um, for the last 50 years, but you can certainly store organs um, if we could get them to those temperatures for years. So we're talking possibly decades of storage time, which would completely eliminate organ shortages that we currently have. Thank you, Saffron. That sounds pretty incredible, storing organs for years and decades. 
uh, I hope that I'm around to see that happen one day. So thank you, Saffron, for your presentation and thank you to Danielle and Fabio for your questions. Moving right along, we are already ready for our eighth speaker. Please welcome Mr. Ethan Gruby from Monash University, who is breaking the wall of newborn health monitoring. Thank you, Ethan. The first month of life is when we're the most vulnerable. In fact, nearly 8% of newborns are admitted into intensive care, requiring cardiorespiratory monitoring to track their health and diagnose diseases. Overall, this monitoring enables clinicians to determine and provide the best possible care in those critical early stages of life. Monitoring is typically achieved with a stethoscope. However, with crying, respiratory support and background noise, nurses and doctors simply cannot hear a baby's important heartbeats and breathing, preventing accurate health monitoring. My research aims to break the wall in newborn health monitoring through combining a digital stethoscope with advanced signal processing and AI provided on a mobile phone. Current digital stethoscopes are expensive and designed for adults, preventing widespread usage and applicability for newborns. Therefore, I'm working to develop a low-cost newborn-specific digital stethoscope, an early prototype of which you can see on the slide, the Koaliscope. Using the Koaliscope, audio is obtained from the newborn, and in real time, the user is given feedback on the sound quality from the stethoscope. If the sound quality is poor, the user can readjust the stethoscope placement to obtain more optimal chest sounds. Sound quality estimation is achieved through feature extraction and then machine learning, which provides both heart and lung sound quality separately. This research is the first time heart and lung sound quality have been automatically assessed for newborns and in real time. Once reasonable heart and lung sounds can be obtained, denoising and sound separation can be performed. This processing allows for clear heart and lung sounds to be heard and accurate vital signs to be obtained, such as heart and breathing rate, whereas noise from crying and respiratory support are removed. So how does this work? Well, denoising and sound separation is achieved by training a model. The database of some examples of high quality heart and lung sounds and pure noise recordings. This model is then applied to the audio obtained from the qualoscope to successfully separate a new recording into heart, lung, and noise. So with this overall system, accurate cardiorespiratory monitoring can be provided to all newborns, anytime, anywhere, ensuring that the best possible care is provided in the vulnerable stages of life. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Please come and join me for question time. And this time, first up, we have our jury member, Rohini, to ask a question of you. Thank you, Rohini. Hello, Ethan. Wonderful presentation. How do you propose to put arrangements in place with neonatal hospitals to test the accuracy of the readings? Okay. Um, so we have an arrangement with Monash Children's Hospital to perform testing in the neonatal intensive care unit. So at the moment, we're using an existing digital stethoscope for the past year or two, and we've been comparing that um, successfulness of using that digital stethoscope with the software processing proposed uh, in this research with ECG monitoring, which is the gold standard in neonatal intensive care units, and um, a clinician counting the number of heartbeats and breathing rate. And we plan to do further testing with our proposed prototype digital stethoscope at the end of this year or the start of next year at Monash Children's Hospital and potentially later on at uh, University of British Columbia's um, Children's Hospital over there. Thank you, Ethan. Excellent timing. And now it is Selena's turn to ask you a question. Thanks, Selena. Thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, my question is, compared to other digital stethoscopes, how sensitive and specific to picking up pathology and how affordable is the koala? So, um, Initially, we're not sure how sensitive it is. So at the moment, the idea is to initially just try to get clear heart and lung sounds and vital signs, um, which has been tested on newborns. Current adult stethoscopes don't usually provide vital signs at the moment. And 
their sound separation is um, non-existent or they just do um, remove background noise, which is insufficient for newborns. Whereas in this research, the determination of vital signs and the separation of sounds is specifically trained for newborns. Um, existing digital stethoscopes cost upwards of $100 to $400. Um, I'm not sure how much our proposed one will cost, but it'll be definitely cheaper than that. Thank you so much, Ethan, for sharing your research with us. And thank you to Rohini and Selena for the questions. Moving right along, it is time for me to welcome Ms. Deepa Prabhu to the stage from Swinburne University of Technology. And Deepa will be talking about breaking the wall of eye-hand coordination training. Thank you, Deepa. Let me start by asking you an interesting vision science question. If a person has been blind since birth and they learn to identify a sphere and a cube by touch alone, and if this person had their vision restored later in adult life, do you think they would be able to tell the difference between the sphere and the cube just by looking at them? Well, actually not. Research has shown that fixing the eye alone does not fix the problem. It is the brain that needs to be trained to process and use this new type of information that's coming from the eyes. Training is a very essential component of any vision restoration technology, including bionic eyes. Bionic eyes are the leading treatment for people who have lost vision due to retinal degenerative diseases. In my PhD research, I have developed a novel eye-hand coordination training device called as the Q-sleeve that can be used to train bionic eye patients in performing eye-hand coordination tasks. Q-sleeve is a wearable device that comprises of a four by four arrangement of vibration motors that can be worn on the forearm to deliver arm guidance cues using vibration-based patterns. In doing so, Q-sleeve helps to train the brain in interpreting the spatial cues that is existing in the restored visual information that's coming from the bionic eye. Q-sleeve offers some unique features such as delivering arm guidance cues, providing error feedback, tracking and recording progress, generating reports and transmitting data. With these features, QSleep also can be used as a training device for providing in-home remote rehabilitation, not just for bionic eye patients, but also for other conditions such as amblyopia and neurocognitive disorders. The design of QSleep has been successfully evaluated in a human trial, and a patent covering the design has also been filed. We are now seeking to commercialize QSleep through a newly founded company, NovaSense Biomedical. Thank you for your time. With QSleeve, we are hoping to improve access to quality eye-hand coordination training for people with low vision. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa, for introducing us to QSleeve. And now it's my pleasure to invite Andrew Holmes to join us again to ask Deepa a question. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Deepa. My question concerns the situation of someone who has lost sight in adult life after having had good sight. And uh, I wanted to know whether you needed to train them for hand-eye coordination again when they're fitted with bionic vision. Hi, Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, that's a very relevant question. Um, yes, when a person is fitted with um, the bionic eye, the vision restored is very different from normal human vision. It's a very pixelated type of vision with almost looking like 16 dots of light. and vision is very developmental. So it is something that we learn to use over time. And um, when someone's restored with a new type of vision like bionic eye, definitely there is a process where they have to learn to use this new type of vision and QSleep can definitely help do that. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. And now it's over to Janice to pose a second question to Deepa. Thank you, Janice. Um, thank you for your presentation, Deepa. Uh, my question is, can your research um, approach be applied to other areas of the body? Uh, hi, Janice. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, again, um, uh, something that we're exploring. I think uh, the whole idea is uh, this um, concept came uh, based on our expertise in variables and um, how 
uh, the, how the brain interprets the signals when we give it from a different modality, like the tactile modality. So I think we have uh, that expertise within the team and uh, we can definitely apply this for other areas such as sports, um, defense applications and, um, and um, VR and uh, surgical simulation training, et cetera. So uh, there's definitely a lot of opportunities there. Thanks, Janice. Thank you, Deepa, and thank you for beautiful timing in your responses to the questions. And thanks, Andrew and Janice, for your questions. So we have come to last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker today in our Victorian Falling Walls final. Please welcome Dr. Scarlett Howard from Deakin, Deakin University, who is breaking the wall of insect intelligence in conservation. Thank you, Scarlett. We are currently facing Earth's sixth mass extinction event. Insects are in global decline, termed an insect apocalypse or insect again. Up to 98% of insects in some regions have declined over the past three decades alone. The implicated driver of these declines is humans. Conservation efforts are generally concerned with animals which are cute and cuddly or beautiful but deadly. Animals such as insects which have a lower profile and are less attractive are generally not considered as worth saving. So my first question becomes, how do I get the public to care about insect decline? Well, we just have to communicate the facts to them. Bees are responsible for every third mouthful that we consume. Flies, beetles, and wasps pollinate our gardens. Other insects are involved in keeping our soils healthy. Now this is the value that insects provide to us. But I challenge you to think a little further and realize that maybe we shouldn't be choosing which species we can serve based on what value they give to us, but realize that they have value in their own right. And by this, I mean that I and other researchers have shown time and time again that insects are incredibly complex creatures with intricate lives. Bees are able to learn to recognize human faces. They can learn to add and subtract and count and even play soccer. Research has shown that animals with high public profiles generally receive more research funding and conservation effort because of the public pressure to save those species. This is why we need to bring insects into the limelight. We need to communicate to the public how cool they are. And this is where my research comes in because how do we make the public care about an insect when they don't really like them? Well, my work looks at the intelligence of insects and then communicates that to the public. I show that they are intelligent. They do experience emotion. They have personalities and they are individuals. We need to move away from this narrative that we should only be conserving species based on what they provide to us and realize that they are valuable either way. And insects have been overlooked in conservation efforts for far too long. To include them, we need to look beyond ourselves and our own needs. Thank you. Thank you, Scarlett. Now, this is where I really wish that I had the opportunity to ask a question because I'm desperate to hear you explain how bees play soccer, but alas, I don't get to ask a question. Instead, I get to invite Mr. Andrew Weir to come and join us and ask his own question. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Scarlett. Um, you might like to answer that question as well, but I have another one. Um, I'm particularly interested in what your insight looks like when it's applied in practice. What do we need to do to achieve the result you're after? That's a great question. So really the work starts with the research and looking at different insects and what sort of cognitive level they're showing us, what personalities they might have and do they differ and how they use individual experiences to make decisions, because I think that's what's most interesting to people. In practice, um, I've actually been able to do this myself. So two of my studies, um, one on insects understanding the concept of zero and one on insects counting, actually was able to reach over a billion people. And we got you know, a lot of messages from people like poets and artists who wanted to work with us to like show the public how cool they were and work on this, those sort of things with us. So in practice, that's what it looks like, but I think we can go a lot further than what we are currently. Thank you, Scarlett. And for our very final jury question today, I'd like to invite Danielle to join us. 
Thank you for asking your question, Danielle. Thanks, Scarlett, for the presentation. I guess uh, following on from Andrew's question, how do you propose to communicate the facts about insects to the public? And how does your messaging overcome that of companies that manufacture and sell insecticides? Again, that's a very nice question. Um, part, of, part of my proposed research coming up is to look at the impact of pesticides actually on these behavioural traits that are, would, should be quite interesting to the public. So looking at how it impacts the intelligence of different insects that pesticides are affecting, how it changes personalities, um, how it changes their ability to pollinate our food as well, which is where that value comes back to us. And so by researching that, finding out what those results are, and then again, taking it to the public, communicating through channels such as radio, um, TV, writing converse conversation articles, um, and having a good social media um, strategy as well, will help us to communicate those things and sort of compete, I guess, with the bigger companies that are doing harm to the environment. And I'll leave it there now. <laughs> you knew I was just about to cut you off, didn't you? Well done, Scarlett. And thank you for waiting to be our final speaker today and bringing home this event so strongly. So well done to all of our speakers today. What an extraordinary group of researchers. I just can't thank you enough, our finalists, for your fantastic talks and, of course, also for your insightful and very concise answers to the questions posed to you by the jury. I wasn't looking forward to having, constant, having to constantly cut people off mid-explanation, and I very rarely had to, so thank you. And, of course, thank you to our jury for your excellent, in question, excellent questions. So now I'd like to invite our jury to please head to their breakout room to deliberate on the results. You have the very difficult job of selecting our three winners who will go through to the national event, Falling Walls Lab Australia. Thank you, good luck, and we will see you very soon. So as our jury disappears into their special secret breakout room, I just thought I'd let you know what it is that our speakers are being judged on today. So there are three areas of criteria that the jury will be judging on. The first of these is breakthrough factor. So what the jury is asking themselves are, does this project have originality and the potential for innovation? Does it represent a groundbreaking idea, initiative or discovery? and could it trigger other innovation processes? The second area is relevance and impact. So this criterion focuses on who is likely to benefit from this work? Who is this research relevant to? And does the idea uh, affect or target a broad audience or does it have a deep impact on a smaller audience? And also does the idea have short-term or long-term effects? The final area is structure and performance. So this is how you actually presented your ideas to us today. So was your presentation well structured? Did it clearly explain the breakthrough and the impact of your work? Did you present a proof of concept? Did you, or did you talk about the feasibility of your project? And were you able to explain the idea clearly to us in a way that we could all understand, given that we aren't experts in the fields in which you hold clearly so much expertise. So that is what the jury are currently deliberating on. But while we wait for the jury to do their work, now it's time for all of our audience to select a People's Choice winner. So to help you do that, I'm just gonna very briefly recap each of our Falling Walls Lab Victorian finalists and the walls that they are breaking down. So our first speaker today was Monash University's Dr. Mardok Shaibani, who was breaking the wall of battery metal storage. And Mardok talked about the crucial role of batteries in fighting climate change and the possibility of reducing our reliance on cobalt in these batteries by using iodine. So Mardok was pitching a new battery chemistry to us that might play an important role in green energy storage solutions to fight climate change. Our second speaker was CSIRO's Dr. Lars Esser, who is breaking the wall of the brain to cure brain cancer. 
And Lars explained just how difficult it is for us to treat brain cancer because of the blood brain barrier, which is obviously a really important structure, but means that a lot of the normal techniques we use to treat cancer simply aren't effective. So Lars explained his work using a nanocarrier and focused ultrasound to open up this blood brain barrier for a limited amount of time in order to allow us to treat brain tumors. Our third speaker was Murdoch Children, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, Dr. Anushi Rajapaksa, who is breaking the wall of life-saving vaccine and therapeutic access. And Anushi talked about the 23 million children around the world who don't have access to basic vaccines to prevent respiratory illnesses. Anushi talked particularly about the condition RSV and her novel acoustic nebulizer to treat respiratory illnesses non-invasively directly via the lungs. Our next speaker was Deakin University's Ms. Shumi Ferdusi, who is breaking the wall of costly energy storage. And Shumi talked about the very high electricity prices in Australia and talked about how we could more efficiently and more cheaply store energy. And Shumi explained the important role that simple substances, sodium and water, could play in breaking down this important wall. Next up, we heard from Monash University's Dr. Kalim Kashif, who is breaking the walls of premium conducting polymers. And Kalim talked about the huge amount, in fact, 1,000 Titanic sized ships of electronic waste that humans created in one year alone. Kalim pitched to us the idea of tackling this huge problem by being able to print inexpensive, environmentally friendly, ink-based printed electronics. Next up, we heard from the University of Melbourne's Ms. Nalaki Podar, who is breaking the wall of water insecurity. And Nalaki talked about the problem of contaminated water, specifically arsenic, which we can't see or taste. Nalaki told us that one in every five deaths in Bangladesh are caused by arsenic poisoning, but she has a solution originally found in nature to break down this wall of identifying arsenic contaminated water. Next, we heard from Dr. Saffron Bryant from RMIT about breaking the wall of toxic cryopreservation. Saffron talked about the immense challenges of preserving donated organs for transplants. And Saffron told us about cryopreservation, which is preserving tissues at very cold temperatures. And the fact that the techniques we currently have access to can't be used for so many different cell types or any organs. So Saffron is finding biocompatible options to the current toxic cryopre cryoprotectants that we have like liquid nitrogen. Next, we heard from Mr. Ethan Gruby from Monash University who is breaking the wall of newborn health monitoring. Ethan talked to us about the really critical vulnerability of newborns and how important effective monitoring devices are. Ethan pitched a new low cost, newborn specific digital stethoscope to us to ensure that doctors can collect crucial data on newborn lung and heart sounds above the other sounds of a busy hospital and a crying baby. And this means that all newborns could be given the best possible care right when they need it. Next, we heard from Swinburne University's Ms. Deepa Prabhu, who is breaking the wall of eye-hand coordination training. And Deepa talked about the immense challenges of developing eye-hand coordination in people with low vision. Deepa introduced her innovative cue sleeve which trains the brain in how to interpret the spatial cues in the restored vision that somebody receives from a bionic eye. And lastly, we just heard from Deakin University's Dr. Scarlett Howard, who is breaking the wall of insect intelligence in conservation. And Scarlett talked about this shocking insect apocalypse, the mass extinction of insects, which has been caused by us 
and the real problem of humans not valuing insects because they're not furry or cute. Scarlett really wants to bring insects into the limelight and show us just how amazing and intelligent these creatures are and to convince us to value them because of the animals that they are rather than the services that they provide us. So my goodness, what a tough choice, not just for the jury, but for all of you in voting for the People's Choice Award. So much extraordinary research. So to register your vote, you'll now see a QR code on the screen. And given the current climate we are all living in, I'm pretty confident that everyone knows how to wait, work their way around a QR code. But if not, you will also see a web link along with the access code. So please, you have until 11am this Friday, the 20th of August, to cast your vote for the People's Choice. And please remember to follow Vesky on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook or all three to find out which of our finalists was chosen by you as the People's Choice winner. So thank you so much for sticking with us. Thank you for being our audience. We're now gonna take a short break as we wait for the jury to continue and complete their deliberations. And we will be back with you very soon. In the meantime, please enjoy the videos which we are about to show or take a quick, quick break. I promise you it won't be much longer before we can share with you the exciting results of who is going on to the Falling Walls Lab Australian finale. Thank you. Can we change the world in three minutes? Three young Australian researchers will try to do just that at the Falling Walls Lab finale in Berlin, an international forum for the next generation of outstanding thinkers and innovators. They will each present a three minute pitch alongside 100 other finalists from more than 55 labs across the globe. It's very exciting, it's an amazing opportunity. I will be able to talk to different people, so potentially there might be a company that's interested in uh, commercialising the platform. Dr. Eleanor schneider fuschik has developed a platform that measures drug concentrations in cystic fibrosis patients to evaluate and predict patient outcomes. So patients currently only have life expectancies of about 40 years, which is not good enough just yet. So we still need to work on giving them longer life expectancies and helping them live better lives. Kate Seacom is investigating the gut microbiome's role in personalising cancer treatments to prevent intestinal toxicity, which can have a debilitating effect on a patient's quality of life. Being able to predict gut toxicity from a range of cancer treatments is um, going to save money, it's going to save people's embarrassment, save pain, just really be able to increase people's quality of life during cancer treatment. Rhys Piri has developed a chemical recycling process to take waste glass, which is currently going to landfill, and turn it into everyday products like fertilisers, detergents, and even toothpaste. One of the things I like to say is we don't have a waste problem, we have a lack of incentive to recycle. So if we can increase the value of the waste products that we're trying to recycle, then it provides that incentive to actually use it in useful products. From the side effects of medical treatments to a global waste problem, which of these walls will fall next? The Australian Academy of Science, because questions need answers. Welcome back everybody, and a particular welcome back to our jury, who are no doubt feeling a bit exhausted after what I'm sure was some very tough decision making. Shortly, I'll invite Professor Emeritus Andrew Holmes Ace, who are going to be moving ahead to compete at Falling Walls Lab Australia to be held by the Australian Academy for Science in Canberra. So to our speakers, if you hear Andrew call out your name, first of all, warmest congratulations, but also please turn on your camera. So Andrew, thank you so much to you and all of the jury, and I will now hand over to you for the exciting announcement. Thank you, Jen. First of all, this has been a wonderful day of science for all of us, and we've all learnt so much from each presenter. And of course, that means you've given us a huge challenge to differentiate. And the jury felt that you all deserve to be finalists, and 
I'm sorry that we haven't yet reached the stage where we can push all Victorian candidates into the final. Maybe that will happen one day. So we've decided on three names and I'm going to announce the three names in alphabetical order. And may I thank you and the jurors for their contributions today in reaching this decision. So the three names in alphabetical order are Saffron Bryant, Lars Esser, and Anushi Rajapaksa. Congratulations. Thank you, Andrew, and congratulations to all our Falling Wars Lab Victoria Heat winners on getting through to the national final. And congratulations, um, to, and, and we wish you all the best um, with your forthcoming presentations. My name is Sally Roberts, and I'm Fellowships Coordinator at Besky. And it has been our pleasure to bring you this event to you during National Science Week. Firstly, I'd like to thank all our finalists today who took this opportunity to present their research and we wish you well in your ongoing research endeavours. Thanks to all of our jury members, Andrew Holmes, Daniel Burns, Rahini Kapadath, Selena Lowe, Janice Munt, Fabio Spardi and Andrew Weir. The event wouldn't have been possible without your support. Thank you to our superb science communicator, Dr. Jem Martin, who has done a magnificent job um, emceeing the event for us today. And to Deakin University, Euraxis and the Australian Academy of Science. A reminder to you all that Falling Walls Lab Victoria People's Choice Award will remain open for the duration of National Science Week. And we look forward to revealing the winner on Friday, the 20th of August via Besky's communication channels. Just use the QR code to select the finalist that you think is being best in breaking down the walls of science for society. Don't also forget to tune in to Falling Walls Lab Australia on the 1st of September, where the winners of all Australian state heats will vie for the chance to present the International Falling Walls Lab finale Falling Walls Pitches, and that's being held on the 7th of November by Berlin. But before I go, um, I'd like to invite all finalists and jury members and Dr. Jen Martin to join me on the screen. Thanks everyone for joining us at Falling Walls Lab Victoria in 2021.